Welcome to Earth Science Lecture. This is Professor Diana L. Pomeroy. Today we're going to be learning about sedimentary rocks. Last time we discussed igneous rocks and volcanoes. Recall that igneous rocks develop from either magma or lava that solidifies into either plutonic or intrusive igneous rocks that have large silicate mineral crystals or volcanic or extrusive igneous rocks that develop from volcanic activity, so say from a volcanic eruption event or from a lava flow. Um, and so that will produce extrusive igneous rocks that have small to absent silicate mineral crystals. With sedimentary rocks, as you can see on the rock cycle, sedimentary rocks develop in a different way. So on this image, we've got our igneous rocks forming from magma or lava that then cools and crystallizes, which is shown here on this purple arrow, that moves into another image, a cross section of the earth, where we've got solidified uh, materials. So we've got solidified intrusive rock, and we also have extrusive rock from a volcano, let's say that's gone dormant over time, or possibly extinct. Now, as volcanoes become dormant or extinct, their surfaces are subject to various processes, uh, particularly weathering and erosion, so these processes occur as sunlight hits that surface, as rainwater hits that surface, snow and ice. All of this has an effect on the surface of the landscape, and that's what produces materials that we call sediments. So the majority of minerals that exist on Earth's surface are going to be silicates. We've already learned about the silicate minerals that are present in the Bowen Reaction Series. We've got our light silicates or our felsic minerals, and we have dark silicates or mafic minerals. In terms of our sedimentary rocks, we not only have silicate minerals that are present in those rocks, but we also have carbonate minerals that can combine together to make those different types of sedimentary rocks. An example of a carbonate mineral would be calcite. And we don't have carbonates on the side, just the silicates. Because again, remember that about 90-95% of the Earth's crust is made of these minerals, made of silicate minerals versus other mineral types. So we've got our light silicates, we've got quartz, the feldspars, calcium feldspar and potassium feldspar. Another name for potassium feldspar is orthoclase. Then we have muscovite mica, and then we have our dark silicates. So we've got biotite mica, amphibole, pyroxene, and olivine. So our light silicates and our dark silicates, again, those combine together to make various types of rocks on our surface, including the sedimentary rocks that we're going to be discussing in this lecture. Sediments themselves are not only minerals that have been broken down from their source rocks, but they include essentially any loose grain or chemical residue that exists on Earth's surface. Usually most sediments collect and develop underwater. So remember that the vast majority of Earth's surface is covered in water. About 70% of the Earth's surface is covered in water. 97% of that water is in the ocean. So a lot of our sediments develop from the ocean. They dissolve from seawater solution itself, or they're found in association with rivers, streams, and lakes. So in these types of environments, uh, that's where a lot of sediments will develop. They'll arise out of those solutions, and they can collect and be compressed into layers through two processes that mean lithification. So when sedimentary rocks form, they form through this process of lithification, where these individual minerals will do two things. They'll compact, they'll compress together, they're compressed into layers, and they'll cement or they'll stick together. So with compaction, the sediments are pressed together because of volume. So when sediments are deposited in one area, usually there's so much material that it gets compressed into one mass. And those grains that are once loose grains, think of loose sand. If you pick up loose sand in your hands, the individual grains will fall through your fingers. But if you have sandstone, for example, which is on this slide, those individual grains have not only been compressed together, due to excess volume, but they've been cemented together. So those individual grains are then stuck together, usually through infiltration of another substance that serves as kind of like a glue uh, that binds those 
sediment grains together. Over thousands to millions of years, those sediments will then develop into a rock. They'll lithify into different types of sedimentary rocks. So depending on the type of sediment that we have, we get different types of sedimentary rocks that form on Earth's surface. So here we have an illustration that I made that shows how sediments will develop into different types of depositional environments. In this illustration, we've got in the background, we've got a volcano that's erupting, and we also have a mountain that's got a glacier at its peak. And beneath that mountain at the foothills, we have a small forest, and that forest will eventually uh, narrow out into a valley, and this valley will then empty into an ocean. Now, of course, this is a hypothetical landscape in actuality. The desert is not so close to the mountains, but in this illustration, that's what I've done. Uh, kind of compress things together to make it simpler to understand. So sediments develop in what we call distinct depositional environments. Deposition is when sediments accumulate in one area. And so there's distinct locations on Earth where sediment becomes eroded, transported, and then eventually deposited. So on this illustration, again, I've got multiple areas of deposition. Sedimentary rocks form from thousands to millions of years and they represent distinct landscapes and distinct environments um, from ages and ages ago. So we've got, again, a mountain and we've got a glacier present on the peak. And glaciers are essentially walls of ice. They're sheets of ice that are very thick and dense. And these can actually erode rock. They can actually break apart rock from their movement across the landscape over time as glaciers expand, where there's excess snowfall, they'll build up and they expand. And as they expand, they can actually break apart rock. So they'll gradually fracture rock and weaken it. And when this rock becomes fractured enough, it can break away from the source. So in this case, we've got some boulders that have broken away from the mountain and they're falling down on what we call a rock slide or a rock fall. And as these rocks fall down, they will break into smaller and smaller pieces. These pieces are what we call boulder size, typically. And so they're going to move down the side of the mountain, and eventually they might run into a stream or a river of some kind. In the higher altitudes of the mountains, we get what are known as braided streams. And so these braided streams are where a lot of our thick gravels and riverbeds will develop, are here. And so that's what happens to a lot of these rocks. A lot of larger rocks, more massive rocks, they end up as gravels and they stay at the bottom of the river. Smaller sediments that result from that water flowing over that surface, those sediments will then be carried and travel incredible distances across the landscape. So those smaller pieces, these smaller rocks that break down from gravels, like sands and silts and muds, these actually move through the water. So these lighter sediments are moving through the water. In this example, they're moving into this meandering river system and they're eventually emptied out into a delta environment and into the ocean. So every single year, depending on the rate of river flow, depending on the rate of rainfall, um, depending on how much sediment is in the water itself, sediment can accumulate and it can actually change the color of the water, but it can also cause excess dumping or deposition of that sediment into deltas. So when the sediment gets deposited, it doesn't just get deposited in the ocean, although that's where most sediment on Earth ends up. Sometimes sediment, when it gets deposited, can not only develop into beaches and deltas, but it can develop into lake bed sediments. So sometimes it settles into the bottom of a lake. Sometimes these sediments can develop into sands that we find in our desert. So sometimes rivers um, that flow down from the sides of mountains don't always open out into a green lush valley. Sometimes they'll open out into the barren desert. And when this happens, um, they develop various muds and sands, and those sands in turn will accumulate and form into dunes. And those dunes, in turn, can develop uh, plateaus over time. Those sands can solidify into sandstone, developing plateaus that gradually weather away. So these are some sources and types of deposition. In addition, in the background here, again, I've got a volcano that's erupting. So recall that when volcanoes erupt, we don't just have lava that spews out. We've also got volcanic ash, and those particulates from that ash can actually accumulate and develop into their own type of sediment from the wind, so the wind can actually carry those particles globally and deposit it in any one of these locations uh, after a volcanic eruption takes place. 
So remember that, again, the majority of sediments that exist on Earth, whether they're land-based or ocean-based, the vast majority of sediment that we find is actually at the bottom of the ocean. So as sediment develops, there's different sources of sediment. There's different types of sediment. But as sediment develops, it often will be eroded away from other rocks that are already present, either on land surface or in the ocean. And so wind, water, and ice in the form of glaciers are the primary agents of erosion. Erosion is a process by which sediments develop from the breakdown of other rocks on our surface and this process takes a very long time. It takes thousands to millions of years for sediments to break down. And this process of erosion usually occurs due to tectonic forces. So keep in mind that every landscape that you see on Earth, whether it's a mountain or a canyon or any kind of cliff, all of this was developed gradually through three major types of forces on Earth that we've already discussed. These are compression, tension, and shear. So compression in particular is the one that causes what we call tectonic uplift. Sections of mountains are pushed up to the surface and they're gradually eroded away. So they're gradually broken down through years and years of wind battering that surface, water, if there's a flash flood event or if sea level rises and floods the landscape, all of these events can cause weathering and erosion processes to take place. Now, on occasion, we'll also have various other natural events and disasters, like fires, you'll have storms, you can have ice storms, you can have hurricanes, you can have tornado events, um, glacial advance, so glacial motion itself, and also UV radiation. Any kind of radiation uh, can also break rocks down over time. The process itself of breaking down rocks, whether it's physical or chemical, this is called weathering. So there's two major types of weathering. There's physical weathering, where a large rock will essentially break into a smaller rock. And then we've got chemical weathering. Now with chemical weathering, there's an actual chemical change to the rocks itself. So recall that with Bowen's reaction series, at different depths and temperatures in the crust and mantle, you get different types of minerals that form from magma solution. And in much the same way, you get different types of chemicals and different types of minerals that can form from the erosional or weathering process, this breakdown of these rocks. Now, erosion technically is a term, although it's interchangeable with weathering, but erosionally, erosion is technically a term where weathering will take place over a huge expanse of time. So weathering is this physical or chemical breakdown of rocks. Erosion is the process that essentially sculpts and carves out the surface of the earth over a very long span of time. So again, we're talking on the order of thousands to millions of years rather than something that happens overnight. Sometimes natural disaster events do occur overnight. Sometimes we've got flood events, we've got hurricanes and all things like that. But again, in general, for the most part, vast majority of landscapes that you see around you were formed very slowly over thousands to millions of years of time, often building up in layers at the bottom of the ocean through tectonic forces uplifted and then further eroded by surface processes through the wind, through flood events, through fires, through storms, gradually sculpting and carving out various canyons. And that's what we've got in these images here. So in these photographs that I took when I visited Utah in 2012, we've got some hillsides here. So on the first image, there's a hillside with different layers of sandstone and uh, cherts that are alternating here and you can see boulders that are beginning to become separated out from those formations of sediment and they're gradually going to through gravity fall down and, and break apart through physical weathering processes on the other picture we've got some beautiful monuments that were developed these are sandstone monuments uh, that are part of the monument valley region the valley of the gods in particular so again this was in utah and we've got some beautiful uh, sandstone plateaus that were gradually formed through wind and water. So these substance, these materials, these uh, sandstone layers themselves are hundreds of millions of years old. They date back to the Triassic period of time in some cases in the lower strata or layers. And as you go up to the top of the plateau, you're getting into Cretaceous or possibly Holocene or Quaternary. Uh, period. So we're getting into newer sediments at the top and older sediments at the bottom. I'll talk more about that law later on. But you can see that uh, it was formed through 
that process of wind just sculpted these out in this way. So after sediments get eroded, they're then transported. So erosion is the first step in developing sedimentary rocks. Sediments are eroded, they're moved away from their source rock, and then they're transported across the landscape or possibly across the surface of the ocean or in currents uh, in the deeper parts of the ocean as well. The process of transport will take on several forms, typically gravity, rivers and streams, glacial movement, and wind. Gravity acts on larger rocks as they break away from their source. So think of that rockfall that I showed you in the previous slide. Rivers and streams carry tons of sediment to the oceans and across the landscape every single year. Rivers and streams are essential for depositing certain types of muds that were critical for the soils that we take for granted today in growing anything on the Earth's surface. Without the river deltas of the world, we would not have civilization as we know it. Glaciers are walls of dense ice. So again, the density of this is different. Now, in a later lecture, I'll tell you about glaciers and how they form. They're a little different than standard ice cubes, but just for the sake of simplicity, think of it as maybe the wall from Game of Thrones or possibly like an ice cube magnified times a million. That's a glacier. And so what these do is they do gradually move. They move because the bottom portion of the glacier will melt away as it comes into contact with the land below. And as, so as glaciers expand and retreat, as they get larger through expansion and as they get smaller through retreat or melt, these erode the landscape. In addition to that, they pick up and move larger pieces of rocks, and these are called drop stones. And so we have evidence of glaciers moving over thousands of years um, through these areas that we call glacial till which again, I'll discuss in later lectures. The wind is something that we don't really think about too much unless there's a severe storm or something like that, it'll impact our power or whatever. That's usually when we start thinking about the wind and worrying about it. But the wind is an excellent tr source of transport. It carries tons of sediment across the Earth's surface globally, usually from wind patterns that are developed in the uppermost atmosphere. And so, Particles that are often too small to see, so particulates like volcanic ash, microscopic sand particles, uh, any of those types of materials are what are carried across the Earth's surface over time. So I had a couple different videos. Let's see if they'll work. I don't know if they will, uh, but I had some videos of, no, they're not cooperating. That's okay. Uh, we've got some videos that I took of a creek that runs in a park near my apartment. And so we've got one side of this creek on the left has larger rocks at the bottom and this simulates in a way the way that water flows from higher elevations to lower elevations so in a higher elevation environment we've got currents that flow more rapidly we've got currents that are uneven that are flowing all over the place there's no real direction to them per se and the rocks that accumulate here tend to be much larger in size. The sediment grains here are much larger in size. Whereas if you move further down in the image on the right, if you move further downstream, so now we're away from the higher altitude, now we're getting lower altitude, we're getting into valleys and foothills. It's here that the larger sediments will no longer be accumulating. Instead, we'll be get softer, finer, smaller sediments, things like mud and salt and sands that will accumulate and develop into the river bed and some of it will again be carried as the water slows down and moves. So in a higher elevation environment, and I'll talk more about this with rivers and streams in a later lecture, higher elevation environment rivers tend to be more turbulent. They don't move in a very laminar flow like we see in the right hand image. And this has an effect on how sediment gets deposited and eventually will lithify into different types of sediment rocks as well. Like I said, rivers and streams are essential. Uh, they're a big part of transport as well as deposition. So when sediments are finally deposited, often we just get the smaller and finer grain sediments. So very small grain, fine grain, sand, silts, and clays are what eventually end up being deposited, whether that's at the bottom of the ocean, like in this image of Huntington Beach I took a long time ago, or at the bottom of a lake like we have here from Ptolemy Meadows in Yosemite. 
Um, so that's where all of that fine sediment will settle out of the water solution and build up in layers gradually over thousands to millions of years of time. So sediment deposition, again, it only creates these beaches and that we take for granted every single day. Uh, beaches, beautiful beaches here are built up from sediment, from sediment that's carried in from wind and from water. And unfortunately, a lot of our beaches today are artificially uh, infilled. So a lot of our sediment that we have uh, on our beaches and in our areas isn't naturally present per se. There's big sections of sand that are actually uh, shipped in from other places. And I'll talk about this uh, maybe on Canvas. Uh, I'll have a discussion about this. But uh, sand, again, is something that's in short supply. Um, but anyway, so the sediment deposition naturally occurred thousands of years ago to about maybe in, since the 19 teens here in California. Um, that natural deposition of various rivers, think the LA River, Santa Ana River, uh, Bolsa Chica, all of those areas were developed as those rivers flowed out and met the Pacific Ocean. And as they flowed out in the Pacific Ocean, they gradually built up our sands, our muds, our silts, that entire region, the entire coastline was developed through that process very slowly over thousands to millions of years. And in much the same way, a lot of our natural environments, like in parts of national parks, for example, like in Yosemite, where sections are untouched for the most part uh, by human interaction, that's where we get a lot of buildup of those sediments over time as well. Uh, so here again in this image, we've got lake sediments that are building up. So Wind will carry sediment from distant places. Uh, often rivers will empty out into lakes in some cases. And so when this happens, that sediment again gets dumped into the lake seasonally. So excess rainfall also can cause excess sediment deposition as well. And so there's turnover of the sediment in lakes too. So it's a little bit different with lake systems than it is with other places. But regardless, sediments get deposited in different locations on Earth. And so think of it this way, every single region that we have on Earth, every single environment that you're familiar with, whether it's a desert, a forest, a tundra, a beach, a swamp, every environment you could possibly think of was developed through sediment. And all those environments are essential to housing life on Earth as we know it. So without the mud, without the sand, without all of that we wouldn't have any of the human civilizations that we take for granted today. Uh, without the mud that builds up any of the river deltas of the world, so think of the Amazon River, the Nile River, the Jordan River, the Mississippi River, all these major river systems as they empty out into those oceans, and in the case of Mississippi into the Gulf of Mexico, as they empty this material, that delta mud was essential for developing crops. It's essential for developing various plains, floodplains, and all of those environments are necessary for building our agricultural civilizations of today. So without that, our modern civilization, where all of our food that we're growing, all of everything, that's all due to the earth itself. It's all due to the mud and silts and the natural materials that have been here um, for thousands to millions of years. So sediments, as they get deposited in one area over time, because of the volume of the sediment, they can readily lithify. And again, lithification is not a process that occurs overnight. So if you were to go down to the beach today and you were to make a sandcastle and you were to make it with like wet sand, that wet sand is just a small component of the entire beach. And consider that entire beaches can solidify very slowly over millions of years of time. So it's a very long process. And in later lectures, in the next lecture in the sequence, we'll talk about um, geologic time and how this understanding of deposition, in particular deposition and erosion, that cycle uh, back and forth, is what led geologists and scientists to recognize and understand that the Earth is millions of years old, that these processes are very lengthy and slow. But through this lengthy and slow process of deposition and lithification, sedimentary rocks take on distinct differences based on how they're formed. So sedimentary rocks, just like igneous rocks, are classified based on two things. They're classified based on their texture and their composition. So a texture of a sedimentary rock is based on three things. It's based on the size, shape, and sorting or arrangement 
of the sediment grains in a sedimentary rock. The composition of that sediment is based on how that sediment develops. So think of, again, all those depositional environments I introduced to you in previous slides. So we've got beaches, we've got deserts, we've got swamps, we've got forests, and all of these types of environments. There's different types of sediment that will form. Even in the deep ocean, there's different types of sediment that will form. And so we can classify our sediment rocks based on texture and composition. So let's get into texture first. Now there's an actual skill that geologists use when we go out into an area and we want to know more about sediments. So sedimentologists are geologists that study sediments and how they form over time. And so there's actually an index card size scale that you can get. It's called a Wentworth scale. And it shows changes to green size, green shape, and green sorting. So the texture of a sedimentary rock is based on those three things, once again, size, shape, and sorting. On this slide, we have differences in grain size. So the way to read this diagram is at the bottom of the diagram, we have clay, then we've got silt, fine sand, medium sand, coarse sand, and then we've got gravel, which has two distinct sizes. We've got granules and pebbles. Notice that along with each of these sizes, we've got a measurement in millimeters, and we have a picture showing the relative size and way that these grains would look under, say, a hand lens or a microscope. So texture, in particular with grain size and grain shape, is really emphasized best in what we call detrital or clastic composition type sedimentary rocks. So I'll describe composition in a later slide, but just so you know. So when we look at our hand samples, I'll give you some images of rocks in a moment. When we look at samples of sedimentary rocks, again, it's the detrital or uh, clastic sedimentary rocks that have these differences in grain size. So there's four major sizes of sediment grains that we're going to be concerned with in this class. And these are as follows from largest to smallest. That's gravel, sand, silt, and clay. Gravel, sand, silt, and clay. What I also want you to recognize is that I don't want you to memorize the millimeter values for how large these individual grains are going to be. All I want you to understand is that, again, the largest grain size, gravel, then sand, silt, and the smallest grain size is clay. Gravel sized grains are the easiest to see. These, if you pick up a rock and you look at it, and you can actually see chunks of other rocks in it, or you can see large minerals protruding from that surface, it's got gravel sized grains within it. If you've got slightly smaller grains, you can still see them, but it's a little bit harder to see them individually. You probably are dealing with something like sand. Now sand has a feeling to it. It feels like sandpaper. Okay? It's a coarse, rough kind of feeling. And then if you get into smaller particles, this is where it's harder to see. So silts and clays, the surfaces of these rocks is pretty uniform. It's kind of hard to tell without a hand lens or even a microscope of the size of the crystals or the sediment grains present. The next category that we use to define our sediment rock texture is shape. So again, this is best in larger samples, larger hand samples, and specific types of rocks have these differences in shape. So we've got rounded and angular. So there's two types of shapes that we find in our sedimentary rocks. These are rounded and angular. This is based on, the shapes are developed due to differences in erosion. So angular grains develop in areas where erosion hasn't really set in. It's from fresh breakage, usually from a fracture zone near a fault line or just maybe from a volcanic event, so from an eruption. Uh, so it's instantaneously broken. And so these sediment grains haven't had a whole lot of time to be shaped by their environment. Rounded grains, on the other hand, they've been exposed to either wind, water, or possibly moving against each other over time. This process is called abrasion, where they collide with each other and they smooth out. And so rounded grains have been exposed to thousands of years or maybe even millions of years of these, pro of these processes. And so they're kind of smoothed out. Another way to think of it with rounded is like, think of taking an angular rock. So just a standard like angular rock, pointy looking rock, 
throw it into something called a tumbler. A tumbler is a large metal drum, and gemologists and jewelers will often use these um, to smooth stones. So when you buy, let's say, bags of rocks online, and they're all smoothed and tumbled out, they took those rocks, they put them in this device, and it turns, okay? It's a giant metal drum that spins and turns, bangs all the rocks around, and as the rocks collide with each other, they abrade each other, and they'll gradually smooth out. So it's very much like that process. Now compound that by you know thousands of millions of years of time, in a natural environment, it's something similar. It was just we speed up the process uh, in order to well, essentially make the rocks look pretty. But that is naturally what happens. Again, wind, water, abrasion that will smooth out that surface, and that tells us a little bit of how these rocks formed. Also, so an angular type of grain you would expect to be an environment where it's not a whole lot of time not a whole lot of change in the environment whereas with the rounded you'd expect maybe a river flowing over an area over time or maybe very windy uh, environment slowly sculpting and carving that surface finally we've got sorting so sorting is the last category in our texture of our sediment and rocks and so when sediment grains settle out of water solution, they do so to develop one of two types of sorting. We call this either well sorted or poorly sorted. Poorly sorted grains occur when we've got a lot of mixing of sediment so that larger sediment grains are mixed in with the smaller grains. An example of a poorly sorted sediment rock that can develop from this process is breccia. So breccia and conglomerate are examples of poorly sorted sedimentary rocks. We've got larger grains embedded, gravel size typically embedded within a sand sized grain. And so that means that the way that these formed was in the case of breccia from a volcanic eruption or explosion event, larger pieces of minerals are embedded in the smaller and so they kind of mix together. With a well sorted sedimentary rock, what occurs is those grains settle out of water solution very slowly and they'll collect into distinct layers. All the grains are the same size and shape. And so that makes the surface appear uniform. It's well sorted. And so an example of well sorted sediment rock is shale. It's very hard to tell the layers in shale. Uh, it's just very well sorted. The sediment grains are all the same size. It's got a single uniform appearance. It looks like a plain gray rock. And that's very different from the surface of breccia or conglomerate. Let's move on to composition. So with composition, I want you to understand that sediment can develop in different areas on Earth, and it can develop in one of three ways. It can develop on land, in or near water, or even from living things themselves. So sediment rocks that develop on land are what we call detrital. Uh, detrital uh, sedimentary rocks. So on this first image we have conglomerate that formed from this process and so conglomerate develops from the collection again of poorly sorted sediments usually gravel sized rocks embedded into a sand matrix and again this is indicating that this formed from maybe a riverbed uh, the bottom of a river and as the river evaporated, it left this behind. By the way, when a river evaporates and leaves that riverbed in the open, it's what we call a wash. And so this wash or slurry of rock will solidify into conglomerate. And that's an example of a detrital or clastic uh, sediment. And so clastic, again, means broken. The term clast means broken. And so clastic sedimentary rocks include the following. We've got conglomerate. We've got breccia. We also have sandstone and shale. These are excellent examples of sedimentary rocks that form from detrital processes, from other rocks on our surface. The next category that we have are what we call biochemical or organic sedimentary rocks. These develop from living things, usually from the bodies of decomposing creatures in the deep ocean, whether they're microscopic or macroscopic. So in this example here, I've got coquina, which is a form of limestone that develops as shells are mixed and jumbled together and solidified um, through calcite crystallization. So calcites will actually link these shells together and make them into a solid mass. And so that's a type of limestone called coquina limestone. And again, this forms that from a biochemical source. 
from organic material, living things. Now this is what makes sedimentary rocks different from igneous rocks and also from metamorphic rocks in the respect that we are looking at living things or once living things specifically that will make up our sediments and that are found in sedimentary rocks. This is the only rock type that can preserve any trace of living things whatsoever or sedimentary rocks. So keep that in mind. Sometimes when organisms die on our surface, they do so in a way where sediments can immediately bury them and preserve them, uh, either the entire organism itself or the trace of that organism's presence. And that's what we call a fossil. So fossils form in this way. They form from sediments that gradually or, or suddenly um, bury uh, material over time. Now sedimentary rocks that form from precipitation, so from water that gradually evaporates or from the water, from seawater uh, minerals that are dissolving out of that solution and settling in an area. All of these processes are what develop what are known as chemical sediments and chemical sedimentary rocks. So some examples of biochemical and chemical sedimentary rocks include things like limestone, which is a, otherwise known as a lime mud uh, that's rich in calcite. We've got shale, again, as an example of a sedimentary rock that could be classified as chemical or biochemical. We've got siltstone, which is mostly detrital, but there's some instances where siltstone can preserve fossils. Chalk, which is made entirely from microscopic uh, corals that have silted in and died, and so their bodies are preserved as a chalk. And then we've got coal, which is from trees that have been compressed into layers over millions of years and so their bodies the trees the bark the leaves all of that's been compressed into peat which in turn is further compressed into coal over thousands to millions of years in addition to these uh, with chemical seminary rocks some examples include things like rock gypsum and rock salt which form again mostly from evaporation of the ocean but those are also classified as a chemical sedimentary rock so again, there's three major categories of sediment. These are detrital, rock-based, biochemical, life-based, and chemical from precipitation of chemicals from the water specifically. Now sediments represent different types of depositional environments on Earth. And with climates in each biome shift, that can cause sediments to develop unique types of deposits. And these deposits are what we call sedimentary structures. So because sedimentary rocks preserve changes to an environment, again, this is what makes them unique aside from igneous rocks and metamorphic rocks. So in this image by Raul Martin, who's a famous paleo artist, we've got a herd of long-necked or sauropod dinosaurs that are moving in an environment. They're moving across a riverbed uh, or a stream here, and they're moving into a forest. So as they're moving along, what I want you to recognize is that everything that you see in this image, from the dinosaurs themselves, the footprints that they're making, the trees, the bark from those trees, the, the resin or sap from those trees, uh, the water itself, all of these and the muds that result from that, all of these things can contribute to developing different types of sedimentary structures. In turn, I want you to also understand that all of these structures can be preserved not only as evidence of life on Earth, but as part of a larger body of rock that we call a formation. So formations and sediment structures together indicate development of different geologic environments over long spans of time, thousands to millions of years of time. Formations are the basic unit of geologic time they represent one type or layers of a certain type of sedimentary rock that are deposited in a region over thousands to millions of years. So in this example from geologylearn.blogspot.com, we've got a river that floods over a landscape. So as the river floods over a landscape, certain types of sediment are going to be deposited. In this example, we've got silts and the gravels that alternate over time. They're being deposited in distinct layers. When we have flood events, the river will deposit certain sediment, erode certain sediment, and the layers will continue to build and build and build. Over time, as the river will evaporate, 
those layers will become exposed. And through processes of uplift and erosion, those layers have been exposed into what we call a geologic outcrop. Now, to us, a geologic outcrop is essentially cliff, but these cliffs contain multiple formations that are stacked one atop the other. Now, there's a distinct order in which these formations are deposited, and I'll get into that in the geologic time lecture. But in this example, we've got siltstone, which is solidified from the silt, conglomerate, which solidified from the gravel, more siltstone on top of that. So we've got layer upon layer that is formed over a very long span of time. And that's what we can see in the canyon uh, today. So the first type of geologic structure is what we call cross beds. So again, cross beds can be found within formations, within distinct layers of a formation. What cross beds are is they're layers of sandstone that are deposited at angles to each other. So there's distinct lines on the surface of the sandstone. And what these lines indicate are dunes, the development of sand dunes over thousands to millions of years of time. And so understand that dunes form because wind is continuously moving across the surface of an open desert. So we've got loose sand that's accumulated in an area, and that loose sand will then pile up into a dune. And these dunes will shift as the wind shifts. So as the wind gains strength, it will knock those dunes over and cause them to move over time. And as they move over time, the motion is actually preserved in sandstone as distinct layers, as these lines that we can observe. And the back and forth, the crisscross of those lines, produces what are known as cross beds. So cross beds actually tell us which direction the wind had shifted over thousands of years in each layer of sand that makes up sandstone formations. So in this image of Zion National Park in Utah, we've got a section of a formation that is between 200 and 180 million years old. And we've got layers of these cross beds that are alternating continuously across that surface. So again, showing how the wind is moving and changing over time. The next sediment structure are ripple marks. So ripple marks are wavy lines and they're often present in siltstone or mudstone, rarely sandstone, very fine sandstone usually, but mostly siltstone or mudstone. Now these structures are a little bit different. They develop as waves gently crest on a flat, no slope beach. So usually due to intertidal action, uh, high tide. So as the waves move across the landscape, they'll deposit this unique kind of rippled shape in the mud. Now in Southern California, we don't really have a whole lot of evidence of this uh, because unfortunately a lot of our beaches here are sloped uh, so much that we don't really have a whole lot of flat sand. But if you go back east uh, on the eastern seaboard, a lot of those beaches tend to be very flat, uh, low slope. And in addition, you know, you walk, you can walk straight out to the deeper parts of the ocean. And again, that's because of the shape of the continental shelf. So the shape of the continental shelf on the East Coast is very different than it is here. There's a lot more deposition of sediment that builds up. And that can cause these flatter, wider beaches to form over time. It's over these flat areas that ripple marks can form. And so we've got a modern uh, example here in Cape Cod, where we've got the mud and the sand slowly being alternating uh, with these ripples from the ocean as it moves in due to high tide and leaves those marks behind at low tide. And then in the alternate image here on the side, we've got someone standing for scale next to 145 million year old ripple marks that are preserved at Dinosaur Ridge in Colorado. So you can actually see um, how those ripple marks were made uh, based on today's processes. Now this is an important concept for later lectures too, recognizing that processes that are happening right now to form these structures and to form these sediments are the same as processes that happened millions and even billions of years ago on Earth's surface. So this is a concept we will come back to with the geologic time lecture, but let's move on. The next sediment structure that we have are mud cracks. So it's about as exciting as watching paint dry, except you're watching mud dry. So think of it this way. We've got a flood event. So a river floods over in a floodplain area. There's an open plain, very flat area, lots of mud, lots of grass, 
all that mud uh, will eventually dry as the river stops flooding, as the river water dies down, the flood waters will eventually evaporate and recede. And when this happens, mud that's suddenly drying from excess heat, from the sunlight, will crack and fracture. And so mud cracks themselves are vertical and horizontal fractures or lines that we can observe, usually in mudstone or shale. And so it's usually from a very muddy surface. So typically it's from that type of event. Sometimes though shallow seas um, can gradually evaporate and leave behind you know, fractured sediments too. And so that's what we see here in this image. We've got mud cracks and also on the next slide as well. So on, in this next slide, we've got some images of modern mud crack development and ancient mud crack development. So on the left, we've got modern mud crack development in Bryce Canyon in Utah, where we've got a very dry area. So sometimes when there's flash flood events in the desert, uh, after that event takes place, the water will evaporate because, again, excess sunlight dries it up fairly quickly, and the mud itself, as it dries that quickly, will crack and fracture. And so it leaves this kind of appearance, or it's got kind of like sections that are cracked and all of that. On the right side, we've got mud cracks that are preserved in sediment, and this these mud cracks are from 410 million year old rocks. And so this was not man-made. It looks like it's man-made, but it's not. Uh, this is a section of mudstone that is from New York, about 400 million year old rock that shows that same process that occurred, uh, that still occurs today uh, when mud instantaneously dries over time. Now the thing is with all of these structures, I mean, they're cool. I mean, they're very unique uh, types of structures, but they don't really tell us much in terms of time. So for example, how do we know that all of the structures I showed you, the ripple marks, the mud crags, uh, you know, how do I know, how do we know that those structures are hundreds of millions of years old? Well, there's one tell that geologists have relied on for hundreds of years, and that's the last sediment structure I'm going to introduce to you, and these are called fossils. So again, fossils are only found in sediments and sedimentary rocks. They're the remains of or trace of the activity of an organism that's preserved in sediment. Usually soft sands or muds or silts preserve fossils best. There are some cases where fossils have been preserved in igneous rock material, really rare, uh, or there are some cases where fossils are preserved in conglomerate, again, really rare. Most of the time though, fossils are preserved in sand or sandstone or limestone or shale. Those are common places where fossils can be found. So whenever we have shale beds or limestone beds, which are actually often used for construction. So limestone beds are often quarried uh, for construction purposes. Same thing with shale and slate. Um, shale in particular, so shale and limestone, uh, they actually yield a ton of fossil material. And if you look closely at the walls of some buildings, you'll notice that there are fossils. There are uh, small trace fossils, possibly body fossils, maybe small fish or impressions of shells and things that are in limestone and uh, shale. And so we have this uh, in California too. There's some uh, buildings in downtown LA um, where if you look carefully at the walls, um, you'll notice that if it's not marble, it's limestone. And in the limestone, you'll see impressions of shells and various fish and things like that. So there's many different ways that fossils can form. And this process of fossilization is a rare process. Fossils are preserved in numerous ways. And fossils are the remains of organisms that are preserved and they're only evidence that we have that ancient life even existed. They're, they, for a long time, were our main marker in time. They're, they served as a waypoint uh, to give us a sense of how old the Earth really is, to give us a sense of changes to life on Earth's surface, with changes to environments over time. And so fossils tell us a lot about the way that Earth used to be uh, from millions of years ago. And fossils are important. People that study fossils are paleontologists. So not all fossils by the way, are dinosaurs. That is a common misconception. In fact, a lot of fossils in Southern California are not dinosaurs at all. In fact, most dinosaur fossils that we find are from the Midwest. Um, they're from parts of the Western uh, United States, like parts of Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, uh, Montana, Wyoming. They're very rarely found here 
in Southern California. In fact, most of the time in Southern California, we find shells. So I've got some examples here of my own shells and fossils from my personal collection. Uh, and so these actually came right out of Orange, California. They came out of Silverado Canyon area, the Silverado Formation, uh, which yields fossils that are from the Cretaceous period, about 70 million years old. And so we've got an impression of a shell that's very much like the modern uh, snail shell or modern sea snail. Uh, and we've got impressions here of some coral and bits of other shell creatures. So yeah, that's what we mostly find here in Southern California. We don't really have a lot of dinosaurs. Now I do have some fragments of dinosaur fossil specimens from collections that have been done in the past. And these fragments aren't really worth anything. They don't really tell us much in terms of um, fossil evidence of anything. But again, that's usually what we find in Southern California. We have some fragments, but not a lot. So we don't get like the massive skeletons that you're going to be seeing when we go to the Smithsonian uh, online in a couple days. When we do that uh, walkthrough, you'll be seeing a lot of different specimens. But again, dinosaurs are not the only type of creature that becomes fossilized. In fact, most often microscopic organisms, plankton, plankton and algae and things like that, those are what get preserved. Uh, as fossils, not really much else. In fact, well, that makes sense. If you think about how much life is really here, the vast majority of life on Earth is microscopic. Uh, billions and billions of microscopic organisms exist. They far outnumber us uh, to give you a sense of scale. So now fossilization is a rare process. In order for something to become fossilized at all, you have to be in the wrong place at the right time. Um, and so this process, again, is something that it doesn't happen all that often. Most living things, when they die, their bodies don't become buried in sediment or their activities don't become buried in sediment at all. In fact, most of the time, they basically break down in the environment. Uh, their bones break down. Those minerals get siphoned into soils, and that's it. Um, sometimes, though, again, wrong place, right time, fossilization events can occur. And so with trace fossils, uh, what works is there's different categories of trace fossils. So we've got footprints, we have nests, we have corporalites or fossilized poop, and then we also have eggs. So with trace fossils, let me talk about impressions first. Trace fossils like impressions happen when we have footprints. So when we have animals that move through wet mud or through silt, so think of maybe a marsh environment or a swamp and animals walking along. You, you can see this when you say walk your dogs along the beach. If you're walking your dogs along the beach, your dog will step in wet sand and leave footprints behind. And so in, in this way, footprints, these types of traces can be formed. And in some cases, they can be fossilized. They can be solidified into a fossil over time. We have tons of trackways uh, from various types of animals over the years, over millions of years. We have not only dinosaur trackways, but we also have trackways of various fossil mammals, especially here in California. So we've got different trackways in that, in those areas. In addition to footprints, we have nests. So in this illustration that I've made, we've got a creature that's known as oviraptor that is sitting atop a nest. And nests and eggs associated with them are considered trace fossils because they're evidence of life. So at one point, that nest and its eggs were alive, evidence of a, of a biological behavior that's been preserved over millions of years. So this biological behavior that's preserved, that's what we call a trace fossil. Now we also have another biological behavior uh, that's a little bit on the funny side, uh, but essentially when animals poop, that poop can on occasion be preserved as a fossil itself. It's what we call a corpolite when it fossilizes. Now poop is interesting because there's actually a part of paleontology where people study poop, uh, study corpolites, and corpolites actually tell a lot about an animal's diet and potentially uh, cues as to behavior patterns that we can observe not only in today's animals, but also in animals that existed millions of years ago. So those are our trace fossils. Now, there's another category of fossilization that we have aside from that. We also have our 
cast and mold. So cast and mold, the example I've got carries on from the trace fossil, the footprints. So in some cases with trackways, what happens is the footprint itself, that impression, becomes what we call a mold. A mold is just as it sounds. It's an impression where that can be later infilled with a substance. And in this case, the footprint can be infilled with more mud or more sand, say during a flood event or something like that. And if that were to fossilize and solidify, then it would develop into a three-dimensional cast of that footprint, of that trackway. And so cast and mold fossils are actually fairly common, more so than what we have with uh, body fossils or even with nests and eggs or even corpolites. They're very common fossil types. And in fact, cast and mold is how we develop impressions of skin. It's in fact how we've discovered an entire dinosaur preserved in three dimensions. An ankylosaur armored dinosaur uh, was preserved in this way through cast and mold in the deep ocean millions of years ago. Its body was washed out to sea. It sank and settled into very soft, fine sands, silts at the bottom of the ocean, which covered and coated it. And the body was completely casted uh, into three dimensions. And so one of the most incredible finds that we've had in, in the past decade is from something like that, that process of cast and mold. The last type of fossilization I want to bring up is preservation in amber. This occurs when different organisms, say, are traveling along a tree, either insects boring into that tree or insects that are traveling up the bark of the tree, whatever. Usually trees will spew out this very viscous, really thick, sticky substance as a last resort of defense. So as a, as a defense mechanism, trees will spew out a resin and this resin can then slowly slide down the side of the tree and trap whatever organisms are trying to eat it and destroy it from within. And so amber preservation is something where, again, wrong place for right time. And there's some controversy with recent amber um, discoveries that have been made. We've made some fantastic discoveries with amber preservation uh, because amber preserves organisms in three dimensions. Uh, and it's interesting because again, now it's not like Jurassic Park, okay? In Jurassic Park, the premise was amber preserved mosquitoes that had sucked the blood of dinosaurs and that you extract the blood from the mosquito and you're able to replicate dinosaur DNA. In actuality, that process cannot work. If you were to drill into a piece of amber and try to extract the DNA from inside the mosquito, the mosquito would be a three-dimensional husk. It would be empty, dead. There would be nothing inside. Now, you could probably try to replicate a tree from that, but you wouldn't be able to replicate a dinosaur. So amber is, like I said, it's controversial not because of the movie Jurassic Park, which is fiction, but it's controversial due to recent finds that we've made in a location known as Myanmar uh, in Burma. Uh, there's unfortunately a uh, slavery uh, trade that goes on uh, with the collection of amber. So there's a huge um, human rights issue there that I, unfortunately I'm not going to really have the time to delve into. I might post some articles about it on Canvas uh, for the geologic time lecture. But yeah, so amber, though, preserves very rarely. Uh, it will preserve uh, organisms like dinosaurs or birds or lizards in this way. Usually amber preserves insects. So in this illustration, I've drawn an ant or possibly a mosquito or a dragonfly. Usually that's what gets preserved in amber. Um, often spiders get preserved in amber too, or beetles. Uh, so those are the types of things we typically find. Insects are usually what get preserved in amber because, well, that's often what crawls along the sides of a tree. So. So as you may have guessed by this point, sediment and rock formations are indicators of time. Sediment and rocks are my favorite type of rock and rock cycle because to me, sediment and rock layers and formations represent the pages of Earth's history. That's literally what they are. They preserve fossils within them, they preserve these waypoints of geologic time, and they preserve evidence of ancient environments from thousands to millions of years ago. Sedimentary rock formations themselves are deposited into a distinct order. So formations can be meters high. So that means like feet, like 40 or 50 feet tall, potentially. They could span like entire countries or states. I mean, for example, the Morrison Formation, which spans most of 
the Midwest and Western United States, that formation only represents a window of time that's about 50 million years old in the Jurassic, uh, from about 150 uh, million years old to about 100 million years old or so. So that span of time is what we're looking at. Uh, and like I said, I mean, that's a formation. So think of it that way, okay? So in other words, when we're looking at this image of a canyon in the Goosenecks Park region of Utah, you're actually looking at uh, formations of sandstone layered atop uh, shale alternating layers. Each one of those sections, one of which I've isolated for you, is, you know, like I said, about 40 or 50 feet tall. And that represents just one formation in a particular region. So these formations are deposited in a distinct order, in a distinct sequence. And scientists first began to recognize this concept in around the 1500s or so, but really uh, started to understand the place of fossils and formations in around the 1800s when the fields of geology and paleontology were being uh, formally understood. When formations are deposited, the oldest layers, the oldest formations, are at the bottom of a cliff or outcrop. They were deposited first. The layers that follow in what we call a sequence of strata or sequence of layers of sediment, the ones at the very top are the youngest, so they're deposited last. So the layers are deposited first or at the bottom of an outcrop or an area, and the ones that are deposited at the top are the youngest in an area. And this is a general rule of thumb, so keep in mind that because of erosion, because of fault due to changes and shifting landscapes and all of this has an effect on how these layers will be presented to us how they erode all of this has an effect on which layers are technically older or younger but this principle holds and also keep in mind that again sedimentary rocks preserve distinct environments and what i want you to understand is that the present processes that go on on landscapes to develop these environments are the same processes that have been acting on our surface over millions of years. This phenomenon is called uniformitarianism, and it's something that I will touch on again uh, with the geologic time lecture, the next lecture in the sequence. So these formations can be further dated uh, using their fossil material, and geologists have done this for hundreds of years. We've used fossils as waypoints uh, in geologic time. And so on this portion of an exhibit from the Natural, Natural History Museum in Los Angeles County. We've got three formations here in order from oldest with the Chinle formation to youngest with Hell Creek. So all of these formations actually represent periods, distinct spans of geologic time with distinct fossils within each period. And of course, these all come from the Mesozoic era. These all come from the time of dinosaurs. But we've got the Chinle formation, Triassic period, the Morrison formation, Jurassic period, and the Hell Creek formation, the Cretaceous period. So all three of these periods of time represent distinct spans of time. And we've been doing this, we've been organizing the rocks of our surface based on their fossils and based on their formations for a very, very long time. So this quote here on the slide, the present is key, the past is this concept of uniformitarianism. And really this concept, like I said, began in the 1600s, was continued through the 1800s, this understanding that the earth is old, these processes are ancient, and the life and organisms and environments of our surface, the changes to that are recorded not only in the fossil record, but the rock record as well. And so for our next lecture, we're gonna learn more about geologic time, this recognition and understanding that changes to our surface have been going on for millions of years, and this in turn has a definite effect on the way that we perceive the progression of time.